coming back from lunch. So I believe the last time we were here, let's, well, we'll start out after lunch doing something fun. We'll look at tic-tac-toe, because I believe last time we were here, I was started to build a tic-tac-toe. I had this one sitting around, but I didn't load it up into Eclipse, so I'm going to put it back into Eclipse, where I had it before. And uh, this is the low-tech version of tic-tac-toe, that if you're in the Java class, we did a tic-tac-toe version using Swing, I believe. And then this is the non. This is the same exact code. I took the code, copied it from those classes, stuck it into here, pulled the swing stuff out, and put in the uh, code for the uh, for the tick for the for the not for the Android actually. Um, and uh, this example here comes from. Let's see. Comes from tic tac toe two that is out here in the Android phone uh, application directory under tutorials. Oh, the internet is running slow again, I see. Uh, here's this one right here. So it's solution two. I didn't put together a tutorial for it, so it's just the solution. And I kind of wanted to show it to you because it was actually kind of cool. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to import it in. I don't believe it's in my uh, projects here already. I just unzipped it, put it on my desktop, so I'm going to go to my desktop and click on tic-tac-toe and bring it in. Ooh, tic-tac-toe. Maybe it's already. Let me go back here. Let me check something else real quick here. Is it in here? Tic-tac-toe? No. Uh, let's check it out here. It's going to be in a workspace directory documents workspace PQRST tic tac uh, let me pull tic oh here's a tic tac toe let me pull this tic tac toe out and put it back in let me try that one more time I believe it was in the project at one point so I'm going file import and uh, I'm going to move in the existing project. It was already in my workspace, I believe, but I'm not quite sure which one that one was. So let's take a look here. Tic-tac-toe. No, that's the wrong one. Let's take a look here. No, this is the different one, so let me pull this one back out. Hold on one second, I'm almost there. Let me throw this one. Well, let me compress this one so I know which one this one is. All right. Unzip this one. Stick this one in here. Normally, I do load these in ahead of time. Oh, Eclipse got closed. I thought I had it in here, actually, but I did it like right after the class, and then I saved it. I probably pulled it out thinking I wasn't going to use it. So, unfortunately, I closed Eclipse, so I have to wait for Eclipse to open up back again. Find the right one here. We found the one that originally that I did programmatically that was a little bit more confusing. This one is all done through the XML interface, through buttons, and it has six or nine buttons I should say on the interface. Uh, so let's see. I don't want this one. This one was removed. So let's just remove it completely out of the workspace directory. Now I'm going to import the correct one in I think. That I unzipped and it stuck on my desktop. So desktop tic-tac-toe. Ah, yes. Okay, so this one is using one main activity project. And if you're in the Java class, what I did is I took the uh, Java code that we did for our tic-tac-toe in Java using Swing that had buttons, actually, uh, with uh, images on the buttons. And uh, I took here and I created another project with a resource here uh, that contains 
and drawable folder, you can open up the project and see that we have a blank, and we have a zero, and we have an X um, image. This is the same zero. Actually, I think you gave them to me or something. <laughs> it took the same images that they did for the iPhone. Or maybe we did this in the iPhone. I don't remember when we did this. I know we did it in the Java class. Okay, and I know I, we talked about a little bit about tic-tac-toe for some strange reason uh, last time, but let's take a look at the interface. The uh, tic-tac-toe I originally showed you was done programmatically. This one's all done through the XML interface. So what I did is I took here and put uh, nine little boxes on here. These are image buttons. Image button one through nine. And I just stick a, stuck them in the middle of a form here. It's a tic-tac-toe game. And uh, the buttons here look like this. It's in a relative layout. So I drag the buttons over, put them in relationship with each other in rows and columns. And I got image button one, image button two, three, all the way down to um, image button uh, nine. And uh, they're using a sources drawable blank, drawable blank. So from the drawable directory here, I have one that's blank. It's just a blank image. So if you download this project, you'll see the images. Everything's complete. You don't have to do anything to it. So now if I look at the source code that's associated with it, this is the part I wanted to really show you. It's very low tech, very low key here. Um, it's using the same theory as before. It's keeping track of the selection uh, as either selected, and then how many have we selected to keep track of when the game's over with, to determine if there's been a tie or not. And there's an integer count, and then there's a win. That's a Boolean that's set to false initially, meaning nobody won. On the onCreate, it's doing nothing more than creating the board. And then the user is going to click on the uh, user is going to click on the buttons. And then I have a void button on click with the view. So if I look at the XML interface here. Oops, what did I do with it? Resource, resource. I go to lunch and I gotta go find everything again. <laughs> Why did I close that? <laughs> I did the old fashioned way, but I put them all on the same method. So this is interesting because we just talked about button clicks and how to set the listeners. What I did is I said button on click. I could have called it anything I wanted to, but I called the method this way. So I put an on click on each one of the buttons, so all nine buttons call the same method. So if I go back to this method over here, this is what the method looks like. And uh, this method here is the same method that we were running in the Java code. If you're in the Java class and you took a look at that Java code, we're saying case r.id image button 1, then selected is equal to 1, and then run the calculate method. And then we're doing two, three, four. What does the calculate method do? Here's the calculate method. Calculate says count plus plus. Keeps track of how many times people have clicked on stuff. Because it runs for all of the button clicks. So if they clicked on it once, second turn, third turn, fourth turn. All the even turns are uh, what uh, are uh, uh, X's or O's or something. And all the odd turns are the X's and the opposite of what that is. It was very low tech. If you remember this example. Yeah. I know, but it's it's the same code. I just basically cut and pasted the code from, uh, I believe this was done in a Java with Swing. Used the same code here, but changed it to the image buttons here. So I set the uh, image button, button one, to equal image one, two through nine. So it's kind of a sloppy way of doing it, but it works. And then switch on the selected, so if it's one, then uh, we're putting in images that are drawable X or drawable O, depending upon uh, which one we're going to do here. So, and then we're also setting enable to false, so we're disabling the button so we can't click on it twice. So, solve the problem of the buttons that uh, can't be clicked for more than one time. And then uh, else, uh, we're putting the O's on here, and I just called the images X's and O's. So in here we have a O and X dot PNG. <laughs> so. And then down here, the check for win, it's the same code, actually. <laughs> it just checks to make sure if the button... Oh, this is the other thing, too. So I set a textual description of the button. So the buttons are holding images. So rather than checking to see which image is on the button here, instead it's using the get context description. The context description here is right here. It says button 2. I'm kind of using this out of context because this one was used for the... It's for... Uh, 
visually impaired people um, or audio impaired people or something. The contact decision is like it either says it verbally or shows it to you or something. I don't know. It's for it's meant for uh, some of the features of the Android devices for the handicap. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm using it though to because I'm handicapped. And I don't want to keep <laughs> I don't want to keep track of images. So I'd rather just put a textual description on it. And then what what is this description? I guess I could have set the ID check the ID instead of the description. I could have done it that way as well, which is probably the more standard way of doing it, but then I wouldn't have a context description on each one of them. So I set the context description to button one, button two, button three. So down here it's checking to see a get context description. I could just get the ID if I wanted to and do it that way, but uh, checking to see if this one is an X and that one's an X and that one's an X and that one's an X, then uh, Three, three X's in a row. And then this is basically checking to see if somebody won. So horizontal wins, vertical wins, and diagonal wins. And then puts up a little dialog box that says, hey, somebody won. And then goes through and checks to see who won. Sets the title of the box to X1 or O1. And then uh, puts an OK on there. And then we have a dialog interface on click listener in here. And this is done anonymously. This is an anonymous class call because you know it's nested inside of the on-click listener. So on-click, uh, dialog, interface dialog, we'll throw up a dialog, and then run the reset board. Well, what's reset board going to do? It's just going to set all the images back to blank images. And uh, where's my reset board? Here's my reset board method. So it's just taking count, make equal to zero. Selection's now equal to zero, when it's going to be equal to false. Now all these buttons got set back to uh, Button blanks, button blank, button blank for each one of the buttons. Now you can see I have a lot of repeated code here. I've got all the buttons here. Well, kind of sloppy. Put them inside a method call, and then I got all the buttons up here. Or do I have the buttons up here? I know I have them up here. So I'm here, here, here's some more buttons. Get a resource, get resource, get resource. I could have done it up here and uh, made them uh, private data members of the class. Then I wouldn't have to repeat all this stuff over and over again. But uh, unfortunately, I started out writing it this way. And this is the exact example that I was working with the other day. Um, well, I took what we had started in class and I just finished it, is what I did. So it's not the best design, but it's using the exact code of that Java example, so which is the interesting part. So if I run it, I see I have a tic tac toe game that works. So uh, I see I'm running it as an Android app. I'm still waiting for my other app to. My other um, lifecycle app is still running, so let's see what happens. I think it'll go for eight hours without garbage collecting is what I'm thinking. But we'll see what happens here. Uh, so let's see, now I should have a tic-tac-toe game. The first one is selected by automatically, so let's see. If I put my mouse in here and I select X, see if I click on it again, nothing happens. The button's disabled, so I can go O. I can go X. This is a really stupid player. <laughs> oh, I think X is going to win. Look at that. X won. <laughs> and then it resets itself back. I could set this one so it doesn't select automatically because the first button is always going to be selected. So now I feel bad. Let me make the X's win. I mean the O's win. So now the O won. So, all right. <laughs> anyway, it's your low tech. Uh, you're very low tech. So it still hasn't been killed yet. <sighs> All right. You're very low tech tic tac toe game. But anyway, for those of you who are curious and seeing that work, that's what that was about. So I thought I'd show it to you before I forgot. That was created by you guys the last time we were here. <laughs> well, created by me, I'm trying to show you guys. Because somebody wanted to see tic tac toe. It was like a popular topic for some strange reason. I don't know why. All right. What's on the agenda for right now? Uh, let's see. We can get rid of tic-tac-toe. Mm. Yes, let's get rid of tic-tac-toe. Um, I'm going to do some simple stuff, then we're going to write a database application. And then we're going to go back and do some simple stuff, then we'll write a tab application. So I'm going to mix it up. Some writing with some watching, and then some writing with some watching. Mix it a little bit more interactive. and then. At one point, bring some of the boredom away for those people who don't like watching versus writing. Uh, so let's see. I've got intents. 
Here, well, here, here, my intent is to show you intents, but uh, let's see. We've got <sighs> lecture number five, five and six. So I'll start out with some, because uh, you guys just had a break, so I'll start out with some, some lecture five stuff first. And then we'll move over um, and look at uh, continuation of string concepts. So we saw strings last time. And uh, I know that uh, you guys need a little bit of refresher on this because I had, I had about four people come up with me and show me error messages. And it's either because you're using a string that you haven't defined yet, or you're not using a string, or you're using a string that has been defined, but you're using it in the wrong context. Or you're using an array that's supposed to be a number array, but it's a string array or something. So I thought I'd talk about arrays and strings for a few, just to refresh your memory. So strings in the XML format, it's possible to provide mapping. So it's a mapping between strings and names of strings that your application is going to use. So you reference the name and then you replace it with the actual string. It allows for single find and replacement of strings. So you only change it one spot and simple customization, and then also for internationalization. And one of the projects we'll be working on is an internationalization project. So, so we know it's loaded in the resource value string, and we saw that before. We loaded up some strings. We had red string, blue string. We did this last time, actually. So by default, Eclipse will generate a few string resources for you. Here's what they look like. And actually, this is what we did last time, actually. <coughs> we have a string file that's created that has an opening and closing resource tag that says string name hello string app this is what you get by default and that's equivalent to saying string app name is equal to string you can hard code your strings no problem the only thing is is it's harder to change them further down the road so to use another XML file you can make multiple references so we see this at string because the file is called string we could say at my special strings or at something or other, which is important to note actually. We can uh, bring up, uh, let's see, I think I'm probably going to look at layouts next. So I'll open up layouts so we can kind of see what I'm talking about here. If I look in the resource folder and I look under values, I see strings here. And I actually, this is layouts, must be the old one. I see colors. I believe this is the one we did before, color one through color six. They gave us uh, color examples. And this may have been an old example we looked at already, or if not, we're going to be looking at it soon. Uh, where we've defined other ones, what we call it colors. So when we use colors, we can go at symbol colors, which was the interesting thing because somebody had. Uh, shown me something and I didn't realize that the at actually referred to as location. It's like a directive. And this, the name of the file in this particular case is called string. That's string.xml, but it doesn't have to be called string. You can call it colors, uh, cameras, pictures, uh, anything you want, actually. So it refers to the resource definition. I already saw with IDs, actually, because at ID is actually a definition ID that's in the R resource. So when we go at ID, we create IDs that we're going to use. It's another resource, by the way. So to use it in the code, we use a get string, r.string.name. This can be used for anything. It doesn't have to be used in the resource files for the, uh, U the UI. It doesn't have to be used in XML either. It can be used programmatically in the code, just like creating a string. So if we have application name, if we have um, something in general, we can also log the strings. <laughs> so we can create strings and log the strings. So here's an example here. To use it in the code, we use a get string. So here's a, a string example, get string. And the string is from r.string.hello, which is what we get automatically with one of the examples here. And this is on the onCreate. And we're just going to put in the log. We've seen the logs earlier this morning. Uh, we're seeing the log here. It's going to put hello world in here, and it's coming from string examples, which is the application it's coming from. So Now we can also create arrays in uh, XML as well. Um, so we saw that with an array.xml file that we created last time, 
two main types of arrays can be specified, string arrays and integer arrays. So just because we're working with strings doesn't necessarily mean we have to stay with strings. If we're going to use numbers, we can make number arrays as well and store them the same way. So a string array, <coughs> which is what we saw with the colors, here's one with the names of the week. So the array of the string can be loaded in the same string XML file. So an array entry can be referenced to another predefined string as well. Uh, so what do we have here? string name hello and then in here instead of putting it into a separate file which is what we did in an example last time we put it in a we made a, an array.xml file and put it in there we can just put it in here by specifying this out as a string dash array the name of it's going to be business days array and then we have monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday and then friday we say well we don't want to hard code it we'll just take it from at string friday and then we can use that one so we can nest strings inside of string definitions. We can make strings inside of other string files. We can create arrays inside of regular string files. This is the string.h file, excuse string.xml file, by the way. <clears throat> so using the code, we can get a get string array with the name of the array. So we can request a reference to the resource via the get resources as well. So a request is appropriate for the name of the array resource. So here's some more where we have string business days is going to be equal to resource information dot get string array and we're getting the got get string array from r dot array dot business days array and that's in this array here with the strings that we normally have for the uh, example in the strings dot xml file where we've defined string array so we're using a get instead of a get string here in the um, well, get string array instead of the get string, which I believe is here, the get string method. So we can get string array to do a very similar approach to it. And we're going to get that from here and we're going to put it into a string array. So this is a string array. So integer arrays also work the same way. We create a new resource value, name it uh, anything of your choice. Arrays.xml is reasonable name, doesn't really matter. Load it in the, the values folder. Create a new file here. Right mouse click on it. File new. What you're doing is creating, we did this last time by the way, create a new XML file. And then load it up this way. So it says instead of string dash array, it says integer dash array. Uh, you can have float dash array, string dash array, integer dash array, character dash array. <laughs> Any data type that's uh, natural in terms of storing numbers or sequences. So here's an integer array. It looks like a lot like the string array except the small XML differences. The small XML differences are that we don't have opening and closing parentheses, brackets. We have uh, just numbers in here. Access to the code is very similar as well. So we're going to use resources information dot get string array business arrays and down here it says get int array. So we have a method called integer to get integer array. Uh, strings and integers are very common for doing this. And then we have the built-in methods for it. <coughs> so the um, difference is the only in particular name of the definition of the array and then the assignment of the values for the array. And so uh, technically a string array could have been defined in its array.xml file as well. You can put them both together and here they are both together. It's just a defining a file and resource folder. So the file names are the array resources. They're relevant. Here we have integer array with string array all in one file. Most people will put them all in one file. If you have a separate file for everything, it's a little bit cumbersome to work with. It's like, what did I do with that string array? And you're not going to call it string array or arrays. You're going to call it my colors or colors or something like that. So using arrays with an array uh, adapter. Um, same thing as we did uh, with uh, the, the group, the view groups. So here we have a city array going back to that city example. And then we have a city array example. What city adapter, excuse me, is new array adapter. The character sequences are the same example we looked at earlier, continuation of that. Now we can do this. We can do resource information is equal to get resources and then use that as a count. Uh, ACC teams is going to be equal to 
resource information dot get string array and get the teams out of that. And then uh, down here I got the team spinner. It might be a little spinner or the team spinner. If we have a team spinner out there. And then load it through the adapted uh, throw load it through the sequence that we got through the adapter. So adapter dot get set drop down view resource to the simple spinner drop down item and then um, add the uh, array dot acc underscore teams to it along with the one for the simple layout spinner items. <coughs> so it's just basically using it um, together um, to work with the adapter as well. So in our very first hello world example, and I'm switching topics now back to multiple activities. In our very first hello world example we talked about um, intents and I'm seeing a lot of code examples that are actually having problems with them and a lot of people haven't gotten that to work actually for some reason. Uh, which is kind of odd, actually. Uh, so let's take a look at it. intents. I've got three different intent examples that are all doing the same thing, but in three different ways. Very similar to what we did with the uh, listeners, um, actually. So if our projects are limited to one, well, not our projects, but most projects have one activity in them. So we're going to do and look at extra application communication, the communication between the intents having multiple activities within the own ap application. And then we also have inter and intra application communication. So the inter is outside explaining the capabilities of other interactions and then interactions within the same application. So first goal here is uh, looking at the concept of uh, running two activities. So the first button in one activity leads to an opening of a second activity. And uh, this is very similar to what we did with the name getter. So we had an activity that uh, got a name and then you press the button and it sends the name to the second activity using an intent, which we've seen so far, and uh, populated the name onto the, onto the canvas. So all activities within the ap application, they need to be specified within the application Android manifest. So 99.9% .9 of all the problems I've seen today, actually, with people's code examples, were because the manifest doesn't include both activities nor does it include the intent filter or any information needed for the intent. So it brings up the concept of the Android manifest, which is the traffic cop. It's the, the guy in charge of your application. So if it doesn't know about any of the activities, it's not going to run the activities for you, and regardless of how much functionality you've got written in there. Not only that, but you're never going to get an error message at all. You'll get some funny debugging messages, hopefully but you're not going to get very much out of the system from that. So the first activity launches and then the second activity launches in this particular case. And when we're looking at this particular one here where our first activity has a button that says press me and the next activity is going to go and here I am in the second activity. So if we're looking at the manifest that works with this, we have an activity here that's defined and then we have an activity down here that's defined. So we put both activities in here and then we have an intent filter that's defined between the activity. So if you want to think of this abstractly, you can kind of think of it as one activity with a hose between it. And this is what we did before. We bundled up some information and we stuffed it through the hose. And what we bundled up was the string name that we got from the name getter. So we have a bundle that we can send uh, between the two activities. That's the filter. That's the intent filter is the communication that's going on between the two of them. It's, I don't know why, it's, uh, why it gives people complications, but one of them has the ability to launch the other in terms of its category or if in terms of its uh, main activity. One could be the main activity. So and here we have Android intent dot act action is main, runs as a main action, and then we have the intent category launcher launches an activity. So one activity can launch another activity so here we have the activity, and we're defining it as dot first activity. Well, in this particular case, it would be a you know a file that was called first activity dot Java, and then we have second activity here, and the dots from the package actually is from the package that you've created. So if you did edu dot itu dot first activity is where that's coming from, and then we're going to set a drawable icon for that particular activity the application name that's built in as a string. So really all you have to do is remember you're going to have two sets of activity tags if you have two activities. If you have three activities you're going to put three tags in there. 
four. You're going to put four tags in there. Nine times out of ten, a person comes up to me and says, hey, it's not calling it. And I look at the manifest, and it doesn't have anything outside of the main activity in there. And well, that's probably why it's never going to call it. <laughs> so the fundamental intra and inter-application communication is the intent. Abstract description. What do they call it? An intent? Don't know. But that's the word for it. Abstract description of an activity to be performed can be directed to a specific component to be handled or performed, or you can broadcast it. We have broadcast intents on the device. We're going to see that today as well. Triggering a response and a handling of an appropriate component. We broadcast it out so that something, it's an intent broadcaster, says, I need help from something, and something comes back and helps me <laughs> from a broadcast message that we're sending out. Versus, I need you to help me, and then you are my intent, so I, I specifically invoke you, and then you take over and you help me. You do something. It's like assignment. Is you going to assign it to one person, you're going to assign it to everybody in the room, and someone's going to volunteer. Versus, that's broadcast versus non-broadcast. Um, so the intents themselves, simplest intents, are used to just trigger a specific known other activity. That's the... Um, intent to run a particular class. You have no specific description except for the target class. So when we send out the intent, we've seen this before because we've done this before and that's all we've done so far. And we've said intent, intent equals new intent. My activity dot this, here's who I am, my other activity dot class, which means my activity, this intends, in fact you can leave out this part of it and just put in this which is what we did before, which means me want you to do something. <laughs> and you were right here. This, unfortunately, we have to put the dot class on there because we're running another, we're, we're, telling, the, we're telling the runtime environment to run this other intent. Once we've created the intent, which is essentially the assignment from me to you, and then we have to start the intent. That's it. That's all we have to do. These two lines of code you can put it in your program and it works, except for if you don't put it in the manifest, it's not going to work. Manifest has to give permission for both of the two activities, you and the other one over there, along with anything else you're going to put in terms of the filter in between the two of you. Um, so intent parameters. The current context, which is the current activity, and then the target activity. Uh, so let's see. The start activity is the method of the activity class with whom the intent parameters are going to be used for, forces the creation of the new activity, passes the intent to the new activity. The second activity is an independent piece, no return of information to the first. It doesn't send anything back unless we ask for it. But by default, it's just like this program is now going to run that program over there. There are two separate objects, two separate classes. So here's our two activity example with two layouts. This is what we did with the name getter, by the way. And we had a name getter XML that had a, you know, a string on there and said, hey, enter in your name and then press OK and then OK. Um, ran another main activity. In fact, this one has a button on it. This is the activity that we looked at above, which just has a button. And then the second one is just going to put, hey, I'm here on the screen, a little text view on it. So this is the two XML interfaces for this interaction here. We're not passing in any information back and forth in this example. We're just running one intent from another, one screen from another, excuse me. I'm going to get there. We're going to broadcast in a few minutes. <laughs> but I thought I'd con contrast the two of them. Uh, so normally what we have are the two layouts. And so... Um, and we have broadcast senders and broadcast receivers. Um, the two examples here are the two layouts, the first activity and the second activity. And then we have two classes that work with that. Um, so here are our two classes, our two activities. So our activities are going to control the class. So this one here says set context to r.layout.second, which is the second layout here. And then this one's going to set the context to first or to main actually in this particular case. And then in, on the on-click event of the button, because we're using a button listener here, implements view.onclicklistener, we're going to set that button listener to uh, 
load up that second intent. So intent, intent is equal to new intent. And here's our two lines of code, start intent. So starting one intent, starting one activity from another activity, very straightforward if you can get used to the concept of the intent, I would say. So we'll take that example a step further and then we'll see it implemented in a few minutes. Um, so there's a little bit of repeat with this one here. So all of the activities within the application need to be in the manifest. Uh, oops, wait a minute. I think I clicked on the wrong file. No, I haven't. Um, so adding the activity itself, this is the um, XML, this is the, not the XML, this is the GUI interface to the activity. So when we add the activity, we verify the package, we put it in, we give it a name, and we in inherit the abstract methods we could if we wanted to. The two activity example here, what we're looking at, gets created, and this is where we left off a few minutes ago. We can send parameter values to activities. This is what we did in the name getter example. So we may want to use activity to activity interaction, like a function call. So pass parameters, we can receive back data, return values from the intent as well. So, so far we've done the equivalent of a function with an avoid method and no parameters. Yeah? You said like intent, they cannot return the parameters. If you just don't, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get anything back. You can make it return, which is what we're going to get into. Is what we've done in the past was just sent it something. And we created two intents and we sent it something. We haven't done anything with it past that, so we're going to take this a little step further to see what we can do with it. Um, we can send parameter values to activities, which is what we've done. And they come in a key pair, so there's a data lookup. So we, we sent name, and the name was equal to whatever we put in that text box, if you remember that example. Sending data uh, to the second activity. So the intent is associated with what's called extras. And we saw the extras. Um, if you need a refresher, go back to that first tutorial we worked on, um, which I believe is homework assignment number one, actually. So if you haven't done homework assignment one, number one, you've never you've not heard of extras yet. So an extra is a key value pair. So it's like a dictionary. What is an extra? I don't know why they call it extra either. Uh, the key is a string. The value is the data that's associated. The basic type of data can be an array, actually. It doesn't necessarily have to be a single value. We put extras, so we put the key value into it, so it functions as an intent object. And now we can send the parameter values to the activity. So the notation of the extras is very similar to a hash table in terms of a data structure associated with arrays. So in terms of the hash table, we associate a key and a value based on a given hash function. Uh, when a query is made, the function is computed. Typically, employs a put, set, storage, and a get retrieval function. So. So this is what we did with the name getter, actually. We sent a parameter and values to the activities. So we can put a name in here, and over here it says hello so-and-so, which is what we did. So take a look at that from a number as a search term string and magic number that we're going to put into here in this particular example, just as an illustrative second example here. <coughs> so we have the sending parameter values to the activities from the caller or the sender side. And here's the on click here. And this is what we did actually in that exercise. We said intent dot put extra and we put magic value and a number. And then we started the activity on the intent. And then on the receiver side, the caller or the receiver is going to receive it. The receiver can access the intent that was triggered, triggered the activity by calling the function intent my received intent is equal to get intent. We can send it, but we have to receive it on the caller, callee side, receiver side, callee side, not the caller, but the callee, in order to actually use it. So with the intent return from the get intent request function for using it. And this is what we did actually when we sent, we sent by putting extras in the name along with the name the person typed in the, t in the text box and when we received it on the other end so we could take it and put it into a string and put it out on the canvas. So the value here, my received intent dot get type ex extra and then a key value set that's going to go with it. So here's the example programmatically if we sent the key in the previous example, sender pattern 
here on the calling on the receiver side, we're going to have a label.txt, which is what we did with the hello world example. Set text, get text, search text, and then results set. The results set here is going to be from uh, uh, calling intent. So intent, calling intent, get intent. We have a string for the search term and an integer number that's coming from the calling intent dot get string extra, get integer extra. So getting a string from the extra, getting an integer from the extra. So we're sending integers and strings back and forth. And then setting the label to equal the, uh, the values received from the extras. So we also return values from activities. So since we're considering interactivity communication like function calls, what are we still missing? Well, the return back. So receiving data back return values. So we can return values from the activity. So the two types of uh, information that we can send back to an activity, which we haven't done actually, uh, is a simple integer value for the result code or an arbitrary data stored in a key value pair. So if we sent the name getter something back and said, hey, I got it. Thank you for the name. Then if we went back to that screen, it would say, hey, thank you for that, uh, for that name. I, and I used to have assignment number two was set up to, and I removed it because it was too much with intents. And you can probably figure this part out without actually doing it, but we're going to see it in a few. Send something back to name getter, and then have name getter say, hey, you already gave me a name. Now what's your address? <laughs> what's your telephone number? Keep changing it depending upon what was sent back so that you populate the screen with different items so that you can send other information over to the other main activity. So the other main activity can do something different each time. So each time the intent goes back and forth, you are essentially adapting the program to work differently um, and you're changing the behavior. So to have return values from the activity requires a slightly different style of coding. So open the activity as a sub-activity instead of starting the intent. When you start one intent, you're going to stop the other. No, do you really stop it? No, you really suspend it. You can stop it, however. You can end it, terminate the uh, activity, actually. And not go back to it. Huh? You can terminate the parent activity. Say that one more time. You can terminate the parent activity. You can terminate the pattern activity, yes. I think it's end or terminate. Before you, after you sent, after you call the new intent, the next line of code underneath it terminates the activity, which is going to exit the activity. Otherwise, you have paused the activity. So when you press escape or you go back, the activity is still out there. It's just not in focus. So you can run multiple activities simultaneously as long as one of them is active and the rest of them are all paused. So, which is the same way the phone works. Only one of them is active at a time. Theoretically, unless you've got a service running in the background, only one main activity is running, um, and everybody else is pausing and waiting for something else to happen. So, a sub activity upon closing will trigger a listener in the parent that initiates the activity, indicating that it was closed. So, the info can be sent back through the function invoked when the listener is triggered. So, the listener pattern strikes again. <laughs> so. As because it has to listen, actually, you put a listener on it, and it knows when the child intent. Well, it's not really a child because it's it's not like a parent child. It's two parents talking to each other, in a sense. So, to open up as a sub activity, you create an intent as follows. So, if you open it up as two parents, there's no relationship. If you open it up as a parent and a sub of the parent, then you have the relationship. Then you can communicate back and forth. So to open up a sub-activity, you can create the intent as usual. So this is the example of the intent. And then you generate a unique integer ID for the sub-activity. It's kind of like a process ID, if you think of it that way. So a parent forks off a child and you have multiple different levels of process IDs. So you used to differentiate the returns from multiple sub-activities. So you used an intent, you created this sub-activity here, you called it one. You used it and you created another one, you called it two. So other activities equal to one here. Start the activity passing the ID along with it. So start activity for results, which means start it because we want a result that's going to come out of it. Intent, comma, other activity ID. So instead of just starting the result, which is what we did over here, or start the intent, which I don't think it's so in this. Start 
you can't use it. If you want to send an ID along with it, you can't. You can use start activity intent, which is the intent that you created, and you're just starting it. If you want to keep track of it, you can start it as a sub activity by sending it the start activity for result, which means you want to return. And the return is going to come through other activity ID, which is an integer ID that you're going to send in there. So it's going to come back and give you something in return because you're starting it for results to happen. You're still starting it with an intent. So it's a very similar method. It's just a variation on the method to send it two pieces of information instead of one. The return values for the activities on the caller side. So to get the results from the subactivity in the activity, you have a listener. So the listener function is triggered when the subactivity finishes. Because how else are you going to do it unless you put in an observer? So you have to have a listener on the parent activity to listen for the subactivity to return from its activity, to return the result. So on activity result, as you might notice. <laughs> so it's pretty easy because instead of uh, on click, listener, on touch, it's on activity result. So you put an on activity result in there, and you have a request code that comes an integer value, a result code integer value, and then the intent data. So the intent can send something back. Say, hey, I put hello world Barbara out on the screen. Now I want to send back. She clicked this button, and it says, do you want to do more? Okay, so now I'm going to go back because I got this piece of information, and I'm going to send it back. So parameters here might be the result code, which is the idea of the sub-activity that generated the result value. That's the code you sent it. So it's, its ID self is the result code. Request code, excuse me. Result code is any integer value. You commonly use constants as uh, result OK, result canceled. It's kind of like a return zero out of an integer function. And think of this more like the return call from the function. I, it might be associated with some success or failure that happened. And then the data is all of the return data bundled up into this intent. And you can use the get. It's the extras again. So you sent extras. You put extras. Now you're going to get the extras that come back out of it. Then that, that's going to be uh, coming back from the, from the caller. So return uh, the values from the activities from the caller side. Here we have a uh, result activity is going to be equal to 1. We're just going to set this kind of a code instead of just sending one. Start the activity with the uh, results activity. And then uh, on the activity results, after we sent, on the click, we sent the request. Now we're going to sit here waiting. What are we waiting for? Well, we're waiting for this intent to finish. We're still out here. We're just resumed. We're not doing anything. We're just hanging out. So on the activity result, we came back. OK, super dot on activity result, run the super one with those three parameters in it. And then give us our information here. If the request code was equal to activity result, oh, it came back from this intent that I ran. And the code is equal to results OK, then set some information. Otherwise, try it again. Maybe this is trying to get, like, enter in your password. And it sends out a little request. Oh, no, nope, enter in your password. <laughs> Know, to get a password or something or to get some information from the user. And noting here you don't have to indicate we are a special listener for this. We don't actually have to implement anything up here. We're a built-in special listener. We're not implementing any listener for this. Uh, let's see, let's see, the return value from the activities from the callee side uh, how does a subactivity send back a response? So this is not the caller, but the callee, the guy who received the request initially, the intent, subintent that's running. You can create an intent to return. You have to create an intent to return, actually, if you're going to return back. Otherwise, the user returns you back if you're going to return. Stuff the intent with the data using the put extras. Same way as you called, same way as the parent called the sub. Or the original called the sub. The sub can call the original back using an intent, putting extras in the intent. What you're going to put in there is going to come back through as the result that's going to come out from the return. So you call the set result of the intent intent with the intent to return and the return code integer. 
So the values are given in to the handler in the activity, caller activity, and then we have uh, result OK, result not OK, stuff like that. And we have call finish function. Finish kills the activity, pops it off the activity stack. We can call finish. If we're not going to return back, we can call finish. If we call finish, that's how you kill the first one, and the second one now replaces it, so you can't go back to the first one. You can put finish in as the last line after you start the intent, start activity with the intent, and then finish underneath it. You're not going back to that. If you do that, you can still go back because the callee intent can call the original, can just load a new intent and load the original back up and actually can send in information. Very similar to a return. Uh, but what you're going to do essentially from the callee side in this example is we're finishing it, which means we're going to close out the activity, take it off the stack. So the return values for the activity on the callee side can kind of look like this. Down here on the example on the bottom, we have a return intent. It's going to be equal to a new intent because we're the callee. We want to go back to the activity that called us initially. Looks very similar to the call initially, except for we're going to return with a result code. And we're going to set the result to equal something that we, uh, we're going to send back. And then we're going to finish, which means we're going to end, and our activity is no longer going to be around. So the, uh, my example here uh, looks at the returns the value of a magic number that we sent in the previous example. So the example that was put together here just returns the magic number that was created in the second screen. So if the user hits the physical back button <coughs> on the phone, which goes back to an activity, we well, can do that actually with name getter. You can go back to name getter. What's going to happen with that? Well, the caller on activity result function is called. So on activity result is going to be called automatically. Whether or not the intent calls the other one back again or whether or not the user just goes back manually. So the same activity happens. But it receives a null intent object because we're not putting anything in. We're not putting any extras in the intent. And the return code of the activity is going to be result canceled because we exited out of it instead of using the um, activity to go back. So we're not allowing the activity to go back on its own. We're pressing the back button on the phone and we're going back manually ourselves. So inter-application communication, what we looked at before was intra. So an application can also send out a general instead of a targeted request. It can send out a general. So the request for an action to be performed and intent, but it sends it to multiple activities. So you need a different style of creating the intent. So we need to specify the general action to be performed and then the data to be worked on by this intent. So the appropriate activities will respond if they can perform the action. So you're sending out like a broadcast that says, I, I need this action performed. If you're the object that's going to perform it, then you need to respond or you need to let me, tell me who you are and I'll send it to you depending upon how you program it. So you need the ability to listen for these intent requests. So the intra-application communication, you use a constructor which takes on an action and a data. So you have an intent with a string action that you're going to put in here, string value, with a URI or the data URI. So URI is a uniform resource locator. You know, we can set hard code URI, so it's not going to be like the internet. Using a protocol and an address, Here's a URI. We can say HTTP, uh, and this is a, a school, some school address with a URI and a UR, and a URI for the web address. So URL with a URI. So data URI, URI. So telephone numbers, a URI for telephone numbers. So in terms of what what it is we're putting together here, the intent actions. There's a lots of these built in with a little different action description stored um, for different things. So, and it's all in the internet class. So we can call enter between connections. We can also do it between the, in, within the application itself, depending upon the URI we specify. So here's an example here, uh, making a request from your activity to view a web page, which is what we're doing with intent. So we can use an intent to view a web page, actually, in the same context. The action is going to be an intent.action view, and we're going to create a URI by parsing a string. It turns a string into a URI. 
So looking at this, we're making a request from an activity to view a web page. We've got the action, we've got the view. Turns out, turns into a string. That's the same slide as before. Uh, so here's the code that imp would implement that. <coughs> so what do we have down here? On the in click, on the on click, this code is all the same as what we've been looking at before. We got a go button with a set on click listener. We know what those are already. So intent, intent is equal to new intent. Well, what's the intent going to be? Intent action view which is we're going to run in the action view actually comes from this list I kind of skipped through here. We have action view up here, action main, action edit, pick, chooser. These are all these different actions that are associated with the intent. What we've seen so far is the generic intent to load up another activity. We can run an intent to perform an action is what this means. When we run a separate action tag or a property on the intent, so this is an intent dot some action. That we want performed. And then when, in this particular case, this view is we're going to pass it a URI. We're going to take this edit text field and we're going to get the text and we're going to convert it to a string, parse it into a URI. So this is one way we can actually load a web page if we wanted to um, in our particular, uh, using an intent to load a web page. Just kind of handy, it comes in handy. Uh, so let's see. Put these over here so I know which ones I've covered. <coughs> It doesn't create a new view. It creates a new activity. It, it loads a new URL, new URL into, a, into an action that performs as an activity, but it's not really an activity. It's a sub. You'd have to create a web view and stick in the results into the web view. So it's still not loading in the parent. It's not loading inside of the parent. It's loading the new because you're sending an intent. You're calling an outside activity. The outside activity is going to be a web, a web interface. Depending upon the action, you could take and put a web. If you're going to put a web view inside of your app, you're not going to use that kind of an intent. But you could use an intent to load up a page, or an activity class that had a web view in it, and use a regular intent like the name getter. But in this particular case, you're using it to perform an active an action. It's an intent action. It's going to load up the default browser that's going to be on the device with the page. So it's going to load up a web browser with that. And it's calling, it's broadcasting out and calling another activity that's on the phone that's not within. It's not within it's the really current new. activity. So essentially it is a new activity, <laughs> but it's not part of a, a new activity class, but it is an, it's a new function that's performed via the intent. Uh, so let's see. When you say inter applications, so are we talking to two different applications? Or, um, when you talk to two different applications? I wouldn't call it two applica I didn't want to call it two applications. I'd call it the same application running two activities. It's always multiple activities. Okay. But the activity is coming from a third party browser that's running. If you press the back button, it'll go back to the screen that called it. Your app is still running. It's within your application memory space. The intent just says load this other thing over here, mm -hmm. whatever this other thing happens to be. You can use intents to load anything, depending upon the action that you've specified. Commonly used to load components like webs, what web pages and stuff like that. So I wouldn't think of it like uh, you can't. There's no inter-app communication. <laughs> Like you can't, and you can use content providers, which we're going to get to, but you can't necessarily exchange data back and forth between apps. You can't even do it through the databases, but you can do it through shared resources like content providers, and you can intend to load other features, which is what you're doing with that URI. You're loading something, but it's still running as a separate app. You're yeah. just running it as a different activity. It's not within your app. Okay. I was thinking of an application monitor. Phonage, yeah. yeah. So, which is in my uh, my phone. Uh, so, when I have to uh, load all the contacts, which is there on my phone contact, it allows me to. So, I was thinking like phone contact is one application. It is interacting with that application. To get it's my interacting phone. from an inter application or interactivity perspective is not intra. It's loading it from yeah, the outside. A, yeah, it's and you're exchanging data back and forth. Well, in that particular spot, it's probably working with a content provider. 
Okay. Content providers you can do that with. Okay. Other apps, other techniques you can't do that with. Content providers provide shared information that's shareable among all apps. Everyone can use the address book. Everyone okay. can use, uh, you can actually create your own content provider loaded on the phone and share it among apps. But only your apps are going to know about it. I mean, because it's not who, very standard. Who owns the con content provider? Is that the carrier who owns or is that the device who owns? Who owns it? Well, that's a legal question. I can't answer. <laughs> not, in, not in that. Oh. Um, it's the content it's providers are owned by the operating system, not necessarily the carrier. Okay. It's, it's what... That's a good question. It's the operating system. Well, it's open source. So nobody really owns it. The content provider owns the Content provider. Is owned, the content's owned by the content provider. <laughs> What's the content provider? It's an address book. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Vonage. Well, who's going to own your content? Vonage? Don't know. You know, another good example, actually not Vonage, but Google Voice. You can install the Google Voice app on your Android phone. When an incoming call comes in, it, it, there's a well, there's a observer on that app that's running in the background that picks up the receiving of the call and bypasses it from your other provider to, if you press OK, answer it with Google Voice. Then it will pick it up and run it through the Google Voice app instead of the other app. So it's doing a receiver on a broadcast message that's coming through the phone from an event. It's an event-driven behavior again. And then it could run an, an intent, actually, to, if you said no, it could run an intent to bring it back to the phone provider's cellular service, um, phone dialer, or whatever you call it. So. Uh, so you could work. It does There are some apps that do work in, with each other. From a, Who's going to get this? It's like when you have multiple text message programs loaded and a text comes in. Usually they all get it. <laughs> and then you pick which one you want to look at it in. Because they're not going to fight and they're not going to communicate with each other to say, who wants this? But a telephone call it can only be received by one carrier, by one app, one functionality. Uh, so let's see. Uh, what do we got here? Values of the collie, the caller side, activities from the collie side, caller side. There's a little bit of repeat between these slides, so I'm just getting to the new part here. So uh, images, so we can design something, and there's an example coming up actually that uses images. So you can start an activity for a result, make use of the activity result by the listener, and then uh, handle it within the app. So here's another example of communication with an image gallery. So to request an image to be selected from an image gallery, which is a, well, which is a form of shared information. In fact, that's one of the content providers you can get images from the content. So action underscore get underscore content is a content provider functionality, which is going to be your image gallery. So there is no URI because you're not going to a website. You're not asking for particular data to be handled. So the new type is going to be image. So types are used by a mind type definition. So if you look at that up on the Wikipedia, you can figure out what that is. But here's an example here of an image picker. So um, Image, intent, ex example, activity, yada yada, main activity, extends activity, implements view, dot, um, on click listener, same stuff we've been looking at so far. We have a button, we have a text view, and we have an image view. We're going to use this as an integer value image picker request because we're going to go send an intent and then come back with something. We're going to get something back out of something that we're going to go an intent to. So we have a Image space is going to be holding the image in a text view that's going to hold uh, the URI text, a uh, URI or URI view essentially. It'll be a text view. Um, so I don't know what our interface looks like, but I'm sure it's coming up in the next couple slides. On the click event, uh, we're going to look at the ID of what got clicked. If it was the button, then we're going to say intent image intent is equal to new intent. Well, what are we going to get? We're going to get an action underscore get content. And where are we going to get it from? Well, we're going to get the content of an image. So image intent dot set type to image. And then we're going to start the activity for result image type from the image picker request. 
which is this number that we're going to set. And an image picker request. Uh, well, anyway, we're going to use that storage for a value that's going to come back. So on the activity result, when we get the image back, take the image loaded up into the image view. So here we're going to say uh, on the request, uh, if the request code is equal to image picker request, meaning did we get the one we wanted to come back to? Yes, we did. And the result code is equal to OK. We got an image. Then the URI is going to be return image URI. And then it's going to be return intent.get data. So from the returned intent, we're going to say get the data because you returned back to me because we called you here for the start activity for results. And here's your identifier here. You're going to send this back to me. And when you send this back to me, I'm going to get the data from your returned call. And then the uh, URI view is going to be equal to set text from the returned image URI to, to string. What's the name of this image that you got? And then put the image in here in the image space, set image URI to return image URI. So do we request anything in particular? Now it's probably just going to get the first one that comes out of the image gallery. So here's the application in terms of uh, find me an image. <laughs> you click, it select an image from the gallery. Ah, that's how you're getting the one you want, actually. Whichever one you select, eventually from the image gallery, it's going to return back automatically from the functionality of the content provider for the image gallery, which is how the image galleries work, actually. Um, actually, the iOS and also on the Android phone, if you open up the gallery, click on something, it's finished. It's processing, so it's going to pause. And when, it, when, it, when it finishes, it's going to go back and return from the result. And now what you're going to get is the name of the picture and then the picture because there's a picture. This is the main app. This is the image gallery to select a picture that's on the phone. Maybe not necessarily in the right formats or user interface. But uh, now we're going to take this string here. This is the text that's going to get the name. We're going to set the text to the string that we're getting back. And then this image view that we have down here, you can't see because it's empty right now, is going to be populated with the image itself and the data that comes back. So it's a way of creating an app. And if you take this code, actually cut and paste it and put it into an Android project, it should work for you. Most of these code examples uh, work just fine, actually. With nothing else needed, actually. And so. So the inter-application um, communication here to return the values from contact lists. Uh, so this is, uh, again, getting into the content providers. So to request a contact to be selected from the contacts list, contacts are stored in a content provider. Same thing as before. Images are stored in a content provider. So the intent is dot action underscore get content. So intents with actions for content, intent with actions for URLs to load websites. Um, these are the ones that just go out and say, am I the content provider that provides the service? Yes, then I respond to the intent from a broadcast perspective. Um, no URI, no, no type here either. Actually, it doesn't get filled in. So contacts, contacts, dot contacts, contact item type. So here's an example of how to use this. Um, ooh, we haven't looked at the database stuff yet, but that's coming up. Um, all right, so in the code itself, we are setting, where's our intent? On activity result, here's our intent. Intent, intent is equal to new intent, get action, get content. So how are you going to know these? Well, unless you go back to that slide, it has a, had about 25, 30 of them on there. You're not going to know it. Instead, you're going to go, I want to get an image. So then I know, well, what, what intent dot something am I going to use? I need to get contacts. I need to get phone lists. I need to get memos. I need to get something from a shared content provider. Then you're going to find the action that's going to be performed with the intent. It's because you're going to run an intent to go get it. Intent dot set type. Here is going to be contacts, contract, dot contacts, dot content item type. I know. It gets <laughs> the type of the contact that you're getting. This is so convoluted in the iOS, it's a little bit more straightforward, actually. <laughs> but this is a 
definitely uh, convoluted. Uh, start the activity for result. We don't have intents in iOS either. Yeah. Yep, you're right. The spinner is an excellent example. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I don't know where they come up with some of this logic. Um, anyway, so start the intent and look for this return code. And then on the activity result, when we come back, give me this content, contact from the content that you have found. Give it to me. Well, this is going to be the one I'm going to click on because it's going to bring up my contacts list. I'm going to click on one of the contacts. So it's going to take the information in the contact, that type, send it back through the request code so it gets delivered back here so that I can get the contact from that um, extra bundle that I've received and use it in my app somehow. So while, and this is using the concept of the cursor. Cursor is a bit of temporary memory that's storing from a, same thing as, same concept as a database, and we're going to see databases this afternoon as well. When we do a result, we get a cursor. We could take the cursor from the result set that comes back from the call and use that somewhere in the app. To, I don't know, get the information and use it as the result set. So uh, here we're going to check to make sure it's okay. And then the text view is going to be equal to the text from the return get data to string. Which one do we receive? We got a contact back. And then take the cursor information. So this is the managed query. Uh, I'm going to talk about cursors later a little bit. Um, while the cursor dot move to next, while we have something in the cursor from the contact, we're going to have name, telephone number, email address, which comes back as a result set or a cursor that we can use this way. We're going to set the uh, contact ID to the um, get the name from the set column index for the contact contact contacts ID. This is uh, whichever number happened. The name here, the text um, that's going to be of the name. So this is a um, whoever's name is in the contacts is going to come back. Um, you can actually pull a picture out of there, but anything else, this is just going to pull the name out. So select the contact, opens up your contacts. We saw the contacts. Ooh, did we see the contacts? Was it iOS or was it? It was this class. And maybe it was the Java class, though. Anyway, if you miss the context, there's one of these classes I did a context. <laughs> we, we did this, but not using an intent. We did it a different way. And I think it was, in, we used an intent? Okay. The list box, we were. Did we do that in this class? It was buggy, I remember. Okay, it was this class. Okay, good. Very good. I don't have to cover that one yet, or don't have to cover that one again. I believe we adapted, we built a class from a class, we built our own adapter, I think, on this one that used an intent. But long story short, uh, I don't know why it was buggy, but it was buggy. I'm not quite sure why. Did we fix it? Uh, I didn't set the manifest to use the intent. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have, yeah, I, and this is all coming back now. That was late in the day on a Sunday. <laughs> That's what the problem was. Um, yeah, actually, that's my bad. I didn't set the intent in the manifest for that, which is why we had a slight bug, and then we fixed it. Anyway, if you remember that example, if you don't, go through the video. It's the one where the next video after this, the error correction for the first video because the manifest didn't get set correctly. I left it out of the instructions, actually, is what happened. Um, but long story short, uh, that example is demonstrating this. At the time, I don't believe, I, I remember, we were doing an adapter, list adapter, I believe. We were taking contacts and putting them into the list adapter. We weren't really looking at intents at that time. Uh, it was? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, good then. All right. Very good then. Um, saving killed activities. So changing the orientation of the Android device causes the activity to be destroyed. Activity is killed, then it's restarted because it has to restart in a different mode. So if I could, I'm waiting for this other one to get garbage collected. It's still running, so I have zero killed on this one. <laughs> if I could just turn the computer on its side, then I could solve that problem. There are other ways that activities can be killed as well. The GUI state of the app is automatically saved. Uh, the data state of the app is not automatically saved, perhaps. 
or the mechanism allowing you to save the state of the activity before death are available and employed, a notion that you are aware, already aware of it and able to program it. So, why do we have this in here? Because we're killing it. We finished, probably to demonstrate the finished, which we haven't done yet in an example. Intents and extras. Okay, so with the intent, I believe we're going through a review here, or excuse me, a summary. Uh, we could store arbitrarily store. Ah, uh, we're looking at saved information. Is what this is. Uh, with an intent, we can store arbitrarily the additional information in the intent using a put extra. We also have a bundle uh, in, a, in a class where we can store information using a key value pair. We've seen bundles already as well, bundled states. And we can create a bundle of parameters for the intents and then just associate the bundle with the intent. So the bundle's extra here. Bundle of extras we can put and get member functions that are typed in with their names. So put string, string, get string, put double, get double. To associate a bundle with an intent use, we can use intent goes here dot put extras. So we're, what we're doing is a specifying the intent, specifying the bundle, and we're putting the extras inside of it to retrieve it. So, And here's just some examples of it using the bundles with intents on the caller side where we're creating a bundle, data bundles equal to new bundle. We're just basically creating the data that we're going to share back and forth. We're doing it manually instead of sending it, we're creating it, and then we're sending it with the intent because we're intent put extras data bundle. We're just creating our data bundle. Which is one way of doing it. Just a map. I'm sorry? Just a map. Yeah, it's just a map. Yeah. Um, why they have it this way, I don't know. It's the same thing we're doing. It's just a different, different syntax because we're creating the bundle manually. And then here on the search results that we're going to get back here, this is uh, we're going to take uh, calling intent, get intent, and the string's going to be equal to where we're going to get the string extra from the bundle that we created, and then we're going to get the integer extra from the bundle that we created. Same example as before. So we can save the killed activities as well, saving the information into a bundle. So before the activity is destroyed, we have the on save instance state bundle bundles called. So in the beginning, when we looked at, and it's interesting because when you start looking at the syntax here, and let's just open up any on create method. Course I picked one here. What is this one? Layouts. I don't want layouts. Uh, let's look at widgets. <laughs> widgets is actually kind of an interesting one. Uh, widget initial activity. We always have this stuff that comes up from the beginning. And it's like, well, from the last time that this app ran, when it finished, we saved it and Super's got it. So, don't know exactly what it's going to be when we come back. Depends on the nature of the app. But this is the bundle saved instance state that's coming when the bundle when the when the app is destroyed when the app is killed. So, before an activity is destroyed, the on save instance state in the bundle is called, providing the uh, bundle to save the state information in it. Then, when the activity started. The saved bundle is passed to the onCreate bundle. So that's what that actually is looking for. This is, oops, wrong one here. This is, uh, this is what, and it's in this de facto just template that's used with all of the onCreates. It's just the saved information from the last time that the application was killed. <laughs> killed, destroyed, went out of focus, changed orientation. Because let's say, for example, and you're in the middle of the application, have some stuff going on and you turn the phone sideways into landscape mode. Well, the app got killed. Now it's going to reload itself and it's going to uncreate itself and it's going to take the information and instead of starting from scratch all over again, it's going to restore itself using that information and it's on an orientation change, it's going to set the, set the information in the fields and do everything that it would have done um, to, re, to restore itself back to its original state, which is what the uncreate um, bundle saved information state is actually doing that you can call super that's going to take it from a super perspective as well from the higher object. These do not work when you do a force kill when you kill it forcibly. So saving the killed activity here we go if the saved instance state doesn't equal null 
So then we have the log v, put a name in here, saved state available, and then we're going to save this magic number, saved instance state dot get i get int, and then a saved instance state dot get string, get the string and stuff out of the saved instance state. So we can when we because this is being passed in on the on create we can get the saved instant information. We haven't been working with that yet because we haven't been worried about killing applications at this point or killing stuff. Um, I do believe I have some intent examples that are going to show you that in a few minutes. And then here we have an unsaved instant state, saving state. So it's an automatic method that says if I'm going to be killed and I'm going away naturally by a finished, which is a good way of doing it, you can just put finished in your app and it's done. Finish is going to call this on saved state, where we're going to save save data dot put in put something in there, and uh, save data dot put string in here, and put all this stuff in here. I think of this as the um, very similar to a copy constructor in some languages, or a constructor, or a deconstructor in some languages, where we make these little methods that trigger automatically, and they triggered automatically when something happens. And here we have a listener that's going out to say, well, on activity result, and then we have an on saved instance state, do something. And unless we write the implementation of these methods, nothing's going to happen, which is the same way as with a copy constructor or deconstructor you get in traditional other languages. So think of them more like constructors, deconstructors, copy constructors, state constructors <laughs> to rebuild to fix up problems you're going to have when your app um, dies and you want to bring it back to life or it comes back to life and you want to save the information. I could see this as being a, a big issue for games actually um, on the information state that you've saved for each iteration through you want to keep track of the level and stuff so if they were on a certain level you could save the information and then they would return back through an intent to open up another activity and then return back to the same level, to the same screen. You can also store persistent data for that in a form of a text file or in a database entry that would keep track of um, points and stuff like that, status. So in terms of saving the killed activity, see the t saving two activities return value example. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Example requires setting emulator dev tools to allow for one process maximum running at a time so which is what basically if you have only one process running maximum at a time then any process you load is going to kill the next one which is why my garbage collector hasn't happened yet well I should test it I'll test it in a few minutes but uh, it hasn't happened yet but mm -hmm. uh, if I set the processor to one mm -hmm. then I could kill it and then I would know that that app kills yeah, that's true, but I don't have it is I don't have that example rigged that way. Okay, so the last part of this particular um, in, uh, tutorial was looking at the map view. I will warn you ahead of time: we're not using Google Maps; we're using Google Play Maps. The map stuff has changed significantly. The example that I was going to give to you, I'm going to give to you next week, ne uh, April thirteenth, fourteenth, because I have to rewrite the example. It does still work, uh, however. It's going to expire, if it hasn't expired, it's going to expire within the next 30 days or so, uh, which means they've, tra they've translated everything over to Google Play. And the process for getting a map key and using a map key is a little bit different than it has been. It's not that bad of a thing, however, and we're going to have a mapping example, but I'm going to save mapping for April 13th. So we'll see that on the map view. But uh, this is another concept that uses a key. You take the key, you put it in the manifest, and then you're able to communicate back and forth with a server. And you're basically you're not running an intent, but it's very similar in concept. And it works with the concept of it's not a service provider, it's another provider that you're getting. And you're really using longitude and latitude. I have an entire spiel on maps, but I need to revise it to work with the current APIs. And I haven't done that yet. So we'll see that next time. So now we're ready for some source code stuff. Do we want to take a brief break? Bio break? <coughs> oh, no? Some people saying, yeah, okay, quick one then, five or ten minutes. Five minutes? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes and we'll come back. <coughs>